after soldering and brazing, which I'm not sure we'll finish up today, but after soldering and brazing, the next part of the outline is to go through uh, uh, flames, heat sources, fusion welding. And in fusion welding, you get rid of this problem of surface contamination and surface roughness by just melting the whole surface away and you essentially float away or dissolve away the contamination in the liquid. Okay? So if it's aluminum you're melting, the aluminum oxide just floats away on the liquid aluminum surface and then you mix the aluminum together and it solidifies. Um, if it's steel or titanium, you dissolve away the, the, the surface contamination, dissolves in the liquid metal at high temperatures. And so you get rid of the contamination that way. And of course you have to protect it by shielding gas or vacuum or whatever. Um, soldering and brazing are similar in the sense to uh, uh, fusion welding in the sense that you've got a liquid, a liquid solder, and that fills the nooks and crannies of the rough surface. Um, and you don't have to do any mechanical deformation of the material. Everything, well, not adhesive bonding, but cold welding and diffusion bonding, you actually had to deform the surfaces. You know, diffusion bonding you used heat to help deform the surfaces, so you didn't have to use 50,000 psi, and um, uh, you could use 5,000 psi contact pressures. Uh, I don't know if I wrote it down, but if you if you think of it one way. energy of, of a surface is a function of the Gibbs energy is a function of temperature pressure and mu which is chemical potential. So your independent variables are temperature pressure and chemical potential and so uh, cold welding you're essentially just using pressure. Diffusion bonding you're using temperature and pressure okay which allows you to reduce the pressure from 50,000 psi order of magnitude down to 5,000. And chemical potential is what we're going to get into now. You're going to flux the surface. You're going to do a chemical reaction to remove the surface contamination. Okay? So soldering and brazing, you're going to use some temperature, probably not pr very much pressure. Uh, one combination uh, that uses temperature and pressure in liquid is transient liquid phase, which we talked about. Okay? You don't you can get the pressure down to 500 psi by by using a liquid. Uh, uh, braze, uh, and then we're going to go through it, but there is no difference between soldering and braze. Um, soldering goes back thousands of years, probably six or seven thousand years, okay? Whenever they got copper alloys and they had tin available or lead and tin, they were soldering things, and they were using fluxes that could be things as sophisticated as urine, okay? Just put ammonia in urine and ammonium chloride, which is in, in urine, will make a flux. Uh, so you could solder things, but soldering occurs at less than, by definition, less than 800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the American Welding Society definition. The International Institute of Welding um, basically came along and said 425 degrees C. And basically, those two temperatures, 800 Fahrenheit, 25 are almost the same. Brazing occurs above that. But practically, the two of them are exactly the same. You're going to use temperature, usually not using any significant pressure, but you're going to use a flux or something to remove the surface contamination and use a liquid to take care of the surface roughness. Okay? Now, it's what type of liquid you use uh, is important. Um, this is something out of the soldering manual, mechanism of flux action. But but basically, all it's trying to show is if you have a soldering iron, which is not the way we do most soldering, most of it's done in, in uh, automated equipment for printed circuit boards and things, but in the old type of hand soldering, you have a soldering iron, and you actually have a reaction to the soldering iron might be steel, okay? typically it is iron, in the sense that it's a piece of steel. It'll be plated with copper because it's easier to keep the copper wetted to the uh, solder, and iron and, iron and copper don't usually react very quickly, certainly not at these temperatures. The solder will wet the copper, because often you're trying to solder to copper to make an electrical joint or something. And then you have, you have a flux. And the flux 
is going to clean the contamination off the surface of the solid that you're, you're trying to solder to. You have a molten solder and the heat's coming from up here. And it turns out what has to happen in this region is the, the flux has to clean the surface and bury it under this liquid flux usually. Although we can't have gaseous fluxes, you can solder in atmosphere gases that react to clean off the surface. But the, the liquid solder has to have a lower surface energy with the uh, base material than the solder flux does. And then this is just showing the solidified solder. Okay, solder solidifies an atom. That's this stuff here. So it turns out it's a pretty complex process. Okay, but we've been using it for 7,000 years and the Etruscans and others didn't really care too much about the science. Okay. Um, now, in order to make this whole thing work, you've got to pick things that have the right kind of surface energies. And this is what you've seen before of surface energies of different materials. I put this up before. Water's got a surface energy of 72 ergs per square centimeter at room temperature. Lead has a surface energy of over 400. Copper metals that melt at the highest temperatures are going to have higher surface energies because the whole surface energy is related to unsatisfied bonds on the surface. And something that has unsatisfied bonds that melts at a high temperature means it has very strong bonds in the solid. So tungsten has one of the highest surface energies. Surface energy is a function of the melting temperature and the type of bonding. We remember I showed you the difference between metallic bonding, primary, uh, uh, well, there's three types of pr uh, primary bonding, ionic, ionic, covalent, and metallic. But metallic has much higher surface energies, even for <clears throat> things that have similar melting points. If I come down here to aluminum oxide at 1850, it's got less than 1,000, whereas I've got um, um, uh, copper, or well, let's take platinum. It's twice the surface energy, okay? And that's because the metallic bonds have greater distances. They reach from just one atom, not just one atom away, but two or three atoms away from the surface. The electrons from two atom layers deep, or three atom layers deep, participate in the bonding in a metal where it's really just the adjacent nuclei of, of atoms that gives, you, gives rise to surface tension and, and other things uh, that are not metallic. So, uh, I get things like liquid sodium chloride, so it's only got 100 uh, ergs per square centimeter as a surface energy. So it turns out, fortuitously or whatever, um, things that tend to be corrosive salts tend to make good fluxes and have low surface energy, which is a good thing. And metals, which are what we're going to use for solders, tend to have a relatively high surface energy. And that's what allows the metal to displace the flux. In fact, if you go to Young's equation and you um, look at this bead of liquid on top of the solid with the vapor, and Young's equation says if you balance the forces, if you remember around here, at this point, gamma solid vapor across that interface versus gamma liquid vapor. And this is going to be across this interface is gamma liquid solid. So you just look at the LS across this, this interface, and that's gamma liquid solid. And this says the gamma solid vapor equals uh, tensions going in the opposite direction, gamma liquid solid plus gamma liquid vapor cosine of theta. And that's theta in here is the contact angle. So basically, you should learn to kind of derive equations, equations like that, rather than worrying about. Use my board for all that. But anyway, so if I take and put in typical numbers, a solid vapor liquid uh, surface energy might be. Um, uh, well, actually, let me look at my notes to make sure I get it straight. Um, um, actually, well, let me rewrite it. As if I had a flux. That's what I'm confusing me. I can write it if I had a flux rather than a vapor. The solid flux interface equals the gamma of liquid um, solid plus gamma 
liquid flux cosine of theta. So I've just replaced the vapor with the flux. Typical values of liquid solid uh, might be 200. Solid flux, um, which is basically a metal surface. Okay, this is a metal, uh, the surface energy of the uh, metal surface in contact with the flux might be 500. And a typical value of liquid flux um, might be 200 cosine of theta. And you find that this says that theta is less than zero. Well, actually, it is zero. Okay, less than equal to zero. This is, becomes a, a uh, inequality because five cosine of theta can only go to one. If this is 200, and that's 200. That says cosine of theta goes to zero. So by having a high energy metal as your solder, you can displace most of your inorganic fluxes or even your organic fluxes, which have lower surface energies, which is why solders are always metals. I've had students say, well, why don't I use a ceramic for a solder? Because ceramics have low surface energy. They can't displace the flux. They are the flux, okay? And you need a big difference between this surface energy and these surface energies in order to get wetting to get the stuff to flow. Okay? And that's a fundamental principle whether you're talking soldering or brazing. Now why do we have why do we worry about this difference between soldering and brazing? Well, it's historical. They you know, people in medieval times uh, defined soldering, defined it or called it soldering. But then later on, people came along and they said, they talked about brazing. And it wasn't until sometime, you know, 100 years later that people said, well, really, they're the same process. And they said, there's a difference. The only difference is the melting point. You can look at various solder families, OK? Um, there's gold, there actually are gold tin solders, and gold germanium solders, and gold silicon solders. They're up to almost 400 degrees. 425 and above is brazing. There are lead solders with lots of different alloy constituents. Tin solders, and of course, one of the tin solders is lead tin. It should be tin in here. Well, actually, I guess the way they've put this together, the tin, the lead is part of the tin because it's more tin than lead. Indium solders. Indium melts at 156 degrees C, but with uh, tin, it melts at uh, uh, 56 degrees C. So you've got indium solders in here. You have bismuth solders that people have been looking at a lot for a lot of bad reasons. Um, and gallium solders. Gallium is sort of like mercury in that it actually exists as a liquid at something around room temperature. Okay, if you look at the periodic table, the only metal that's liquid at room temperature is mercury. With about 10 degrees C above room temperature, gallium is liquid. I mean, gallium will melt in your hand, not in your mouth. I feel it melting both. It's not a good thing. It's sort of it's toxic, similar to mercury. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, gallium, uh, and people actually, they don't have it on here because we don't use it a whole lot, but mercury actually will work as a solder. Okay. Uh, people have soldered copper together with mercury at room temperature. So you can, and, the, and actually, well, what do you want a liquid solder at room temperature? Well, they actually form a transient liquid phase diffusion bond. Okay, so you can, you can actually solder copper. Um, uh, I saw a research paper years ago from Spain. Why is Spain doing research on mercury? Because that's where most of the mercury comes from. Okay, and so they're promoting the use of mercury, uh, which is not a good thing to promote nowadays. It's sort of a dying business. They're trying to get the mercury. Actually, it's not a dying business. Uh, it's in every fluorescent tube, right? So getting rid of incandescent lights, things like that. So uh, anyway, so this is the, these are some of the solder alloy families. And there are actually only so many low melting metals that nature has given us. Um, now, if you look at brace alloy fam families, you, we have uh, aluminum alloys, which are just above 500 degrees C. We have silver alloys. And these are actually, there's a problem here because these are called silver solders historically. They're not solders, they're brace alloys. They're silver brace alloys, if you want to be precise. But the 
kind of common name is silver solders, but they're not really solders, but the processes are the same. We have gold alloys, and I may talk a little bit more about these gold nickel alloys today. We have copper alloys used extensively for brazing. We have nickel alloys used a lot to repair jet engines and, and other things. And if you want to go to really high temperatures, you start using palladium, which is like gold, okay? And people use platinum, almost any metal um, that you can think of, well, not any, any common metal. Platinum's not all that common, but it's more, more common than praseodymium. I've never seen a praseodymium braze alloy, okay? Or erbium or something. But most of your common metals have been used as braze alloys because all you need is a high surface energy and metals give you that. Now, the little trick here, which now you can't see it, I've reduced it enough. This graph goes up to 400C. This one starts at 500C and goes up. Nature left out metals that melt between 400 and 500 degrees C. Aluminum starts at 660. Magnesium starts at 660. Not that we use magnesium for solders usually, but because it's too reactive and corrosive. But um, there's not a metal between lead and that melts between lead and aluminum, the common metal. Okay? It's just not anything between 327C and 660. And then if you alloy it, you might widen, you might narrow that range a little bit. But that's why there is a, a break. There's a natural break at 425C or 800 degrees F between bracing and soldering. <clears throat> and we kind of um, use that because that's the way the terminology came up. But it turns out there are some basic differences because of the temperature. Um, the, uh, there's a handout somewhere in here that I've used for years okay, on soldering and brazing. Um, it looks in your, hand, in your handouts, it looks something like this. It's uh, a document that I just kind of copied things years ago from different textbooks and stuff. Um, this is the type of plot that comes out of the soldering manual. In fact, it's in Harold Manco's book on soldering. I think it's maybe a better copy of this book than my, my copy. But he, again, he's got a thermometer here. Here are your solders, there's your brazing, and there really is nothing in this gap in here. There's some cadmium silver alloys, but there's there's really nothing in there. The bands, there's a band in here of about 100 or 200 degrees centigrade, but there's just nothing that exists. Okay, um, and I've had people come to me. Oh, we want something that works in this temperature. I said, sorry, not in this world. Okay, um, so because soldering occurs at lower temperatures, you have different requirements of the flux and certain materials can't be soldered. I think somewhere in here there's a little table. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a table that talks about different types of materials. This comes out of, I think, the soldering manual. Um, and different types of fluxes. And this is the base materials if you want to solder it. Platinum, gold, copper, lead, nickel, tin, and stuff. You get down here to Aluminum alloys are the most difficult to solder. Stainless steels are difficult to solder, very difficult to solder. But beryllium and titanium, had no one's ever figured out a solder alloy that works. There is no flux that is corrosive enough to eat away beryllium oxide or titanium oxide. And no one's ever developed it. And we'll talk about the aluminum solder, or the aluminum fluxes, the fluxes that eat away aluminum oxide. They work by an entirely different mechanism than the corrosive action of the fluxes for copper and nickel and iron and things like that. So it's really, in solders, it really gets down to the chemistry of the flux. You've got to get rid of that, that surface <coughs> oxide, uh, and you can't always do it with some material. Whereas in brazing, I've never heard of a material that can't be brazed. Okay? You can braze graphite, you can braze aluminum oxide. With that extra temperature, you get more chemical potential, okay? You know, with that extra temperature, you get more chemical potential. You have a wider choice of, of materials, 
that are molten at higher temperatures, and you can eat away anything with that kind of with those kind of temperatures, including titanium oxide. Yep. Is there any like physical or quantum explanation for the reason of that gap? Uh, there probably is, but I don't know what it is. So, and you won't find me saying no. I don't know very often. In fact, there's a story on that. Uh, this was back 25 years ago. I walked in the lab, and a couple of students were graduate students were standing there talking, and, and they said, "Hey, we got a question." And so we go up to the chalkboard in the lab, and, and they said, well, "What's the question?" And they said, "They asked the question," and I said, "I don't know," but. And then they just burst out laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? They say, you always have an explanation. And I said, I said I didn't know. And they said, yeah, but then you always give the answer. <laughs> I said, well, just because I don't know doesn't mean I can't answer. <laughs> okay? um, and there's actually sort of a little thing there. Um, a lot of times you don't know. If I'm talking, I can think it through. Kind of basic principles. Now, in this case, quantum mechanics is so far away from anything I, mean, I understand. Remember, I was what that was, even though I got an A. Uh, but I didn't understand it. I got an A, but I didn't understand it. So, there probably is, and we actually have a, a, a faculty member, Harold Stater, who does quantum mechanical type calculations and strengths of chemical bonds, and there probably is something, some reason. Look at the periodic table. Somebody who does that type of thing could probably explain why you got this melting point gap around, you know, above around 425 degrees C. But I don't know exactly what it is. Okay, you just need a bigger periodic table. Okay. So anyway, um, so you can braze anything, um, and I often say you can join anything if you're willing to pay the price. You can't solder titanium. But you can join titanium. I can adhesively bond titanium. I can anodize the surface of titanium and give this porous anodized layer, and I can make a bonded joint. Um, but there's some things that you really can't fix, like children's plastic toys, right? You know, because you just don't have enough bonding area, right? Uh, but if you're willing to pay the price, you could even you could even bond your children's plastic toys. The cheapest way to bond them. Is Make a new one, okay? But if you're willing to pay the price, you could do it. Now, whether you want to, sometimes the price gets pretty ridiculous. But, um, and you have to be in, in the right type of business, and that gets into the material selection part of the course that you watch on the videos. And the, in that part of the course, I talk about the fact you know, in an automobile, the value of a pound saved is two dollars over the life of the vehicle. In an aircraft, it's two hundred dollars a pound. In a spacecraft, it's twenty thousand dollars a pound. Um, in a ship or on a railroad car, it's twenty cents a pound. You know, I mean, it's not maybe twenty cents, but it's it's pretty low, okay, over the life of the vehicle. And so, uh, you're limited in what you can spend in many cases uh, in terms of materials. That's all material selection. In any case. Uh, we have to worry about the fluxes, and this guy Manco, um, who wrote I guess his third edition of his book, Solders and Soldering, um, has a section in here that talks about the different requirements for a flux. And he says that a flux has to have, a soldering flux has to have what he calls chemical activity. Spreading activity and has to have thermal stability. He actually has a couple of others, but I sort of combined some of them and reduced it to four. But to give you an idea, chemical activity we sort of talked about. Because you've only got so much temperature in soldering, you've got to have a flux that will eat away the surface oxide. And in the case of titanium, there is 
no such thing below 425 degrees C. Above 425, you can find fluxes for titanium, for brazen, but not for soldering, for titanium and beryllium. Um, but there are, uh, you have to have chemical activity. One of the things that gives you good chemical activity is being up in the fluorine or chlorine corner of the periodic table. Those things want to corrode it. It's very corrosive. Okay. Um, so chlorides are great for eating away, eating away the surfaces of metals at relatively low temperatures. A common flux, soldering flux is simply zinc chloride or ammonium chloride in water. So if you've ever, you go to the hardware store and you get a liquid flux uh, that's sort of a clear liquid and you put it on there to solder the copper pipes and it's likely that it's an ammonium chloride, zinc chloride mixture. Okay, really fancy, right? Um, uh, we're going to talk about some of the other, the other fluxes, but that's because chlorides have very good chemical activity. One of the disadvantages of the chlorides, because they have good chemical activity and will corrode the surface to get rid of the oxide, they tend not to be non-corrosive. So these two are sort of in conflict, number one and four. So that's, that's a problem. We'll talk about that. Spreading activity. It's got to wet the surface. You've got to have the contact angle. And Mango's got some interesting examples. This example for spreading activity, it has to be fluid enough to be displaced to, dis to, dis to be displaced by the metal that wants to wet the surface. And the example he gives, you can take simple glucose, which is a simple a monosaccharide, anyway, it's a simple sugar, okay, found in your blood, okay. Um, but glucose can act as a flux for copper. The problem is, if you take a piece of tarnished copper, not very tarnished copper, but a piece of copper, and you melt, melt some glucose on the surface, just a simple sugar, and you put a little ball of lead tin, you melt, get it up to the melting temperature of lead tin solder, 183 C, you can then move that little ball of solder around but it won't it'll always stay a ball because the contact angle is lousy in glucose it has no spreading activity you can move that ball around the surface and then afterwards you can clean off the burnt sugar it's sort of like caramel right okay it is and that's what sucrose burns sucrose with a little fat and stuff that's a, that's a toffee right it's just candy right so um you you clean off the glucose afterwards and you'll see a little track of lead in solder, like a slug. You know what a slug is, leaving his little trail of slime on the on the uh, on the sidewalk or whatever. You'll see a little trail of lead tin where it actually had chemical activity. The glucose had chemical activity to remove the copper oxide, so that you could get wetting, not wetting, but so that you could get um, metal metal contact. But it didn't have the ability, the surface tension and the viscosity of that glucose was such that the lead tin couldn't spread across the surface. It allows a Young's equation. Okay? So you don't use glucose for soldering fluxes. Okay? But that's an example of something that has number one but not number two. Thermal stability, this example, is oxalic acid. Organic acid, not all that different than other organic acids that we <coughs> use widely. The problem with oxalic acid, if you're trying to solder lead tin, which melts at 183 degrees C, oxalic acid will clean the copper oxide tarnish, tarnish, no problem. The problem is it vaporizes at 182 degrees C. So you put it in a water solution with oxalic acid, and the water and the oxalic acid vaporize away while you're soldering. It might clean it off, but it, it goes away, and all of a sudden, the spreading stops because the flux is vaporized away. Okay, so it doesn't have enough thermal stability. And some things actually will decompose, not necessarily 182, but you have some fluxes, some of the organic fluxes, that if you try to do some of the higher temperature solders, they just decompose. And that's, that gets to be a bigger problem when you get to the fluxes for, for brazing. Okay, the higher the temperature, the bigger the problem with thermal stability of the flux. Is it going to decompose into something else? Um, and the last thing is going to be non-corrosive. Well, non-corrosive, um, the problem 
with uh, corrosion is that um, uh, chlorides with lead do all kinds of bad things in terms of a reaction that continues. Um, if you look at lead oxide, now a lot of our boxes or our solders contain lead oxide plus HCl. That will give you lead chloride plus H2O. And that's okay, but then that can react lead chloride plus H2O plus CO2, which comes from the air will react to give you lead carbonate and that HCl essentially regenerates the HCl. Okay? So what happens, you don't see it so much anymore uh, on lead battery batteries old enough before we had sealed lead batteries in the car to see the white corrosive deposit that forms on the anode. Okay, and you can go to the auto parts store and they'll sell you this little gel you can put on there that will you know, get rid of that corrosion deposit. What is it? You probably don't see it, well you might see it in, in Florida because you get you got some salt air under your hood, okay, or some salt water under your hood, and there's chlorides there. In New England, you see it all the time because they put salt on the roads in the winter. You don't see it so much in Arizona. Not a lot of salt around in Arizona. But in New England, if you get what you're really, the real problem is, you got some chlorides on your battery terminal. You've got 12 volts, so electrochemically, you're going to get corrosion of the anode. <laughs> okay, the positive electrode is going to corrode. That's the way nature made it. Okay, and if there are chlorides around, the lead oxide, will be fluxed by the chlorides and the moisture around to form this lead chloride. The lead chloride with the CO2 in the air forms the lead carbonate. That white deposit is lead carbonate. Okay? And what happens is that chloride just runs around in circles. It just keeps on pumping off more lead chloride because you regenerate the, the HCl in this little chain of reactions. Now, that same thing that you see on your battery terminal in the car, now nowadays we have sealed batteries like that, right? So you don't see it. That doesn't mean it can't occur. But um, you see it in other places. Uh, uh, but on printed circuit boards, if you use a flux that has a little bit of chloride in it, and the chloride is still there, and you get moisture on that printed circuit board, you're just going to be corroding away the lead tin solder by the same, same reaction. And you can form bismuth car carbonates and things like that. So it's not just lead. So you have to get rid and clean off all your chlorides. Now, uh, one of the one of the fluxes or the types of fluxes that we use, and I think it's in here again, let's see, um, on that same table. And I mean, there's several tables in here, but this table that's in your handout basically talks about rosin fluxes. Rosin is the same stuff that comes out of pine trees. See this rosin kind of gold tar dripping out of pine trees? That's rosin. And we'll talk about what it has in it, but it makes a very good flux. It has good thermal stability, it has good chemical activity, and it has um, spreading activity, great spreading activity. But it's not always good if you have very much tarnish on your copper. A lot of tarnish on the copper and the acid in the rosin, which is called a betic acid. I think I've got a formula for it here. But a betic acid um, can clean off a little bit of copper oxide, but not a lot. So if you actually have a piece of clean copper that looks clean, it's still got a little bit of oxide layer, the, uh, the betic acid can clean that little bit of oxide. And you can use a non-activated flux. So somewhere in here, here's copper as a metal to be soldered to. 
easy to solder to copper, uh, rosin flux. You can use non-activated, mildly activated, or uh, heavily activated. It turns out activated just means how much chloride did they put in that rosin solder to help with the chemical reactivity. If you've got a piece of copper that's actually started to tarnish, you're not going to do it with a non-activated flux. I'll show you that data in a second. If you want to solder to the, the doorknobs around here or the door handles, you probably are going to have to have an act activated flux. But the problem with the activated flux is it will end up being corrosive in the proper environments. A lot of the military electronic specs say you may not use activated fluxes, only non-activated fluxes, because they don't trust you to clean off all the chlorides. Okay? So don't put them on there to begin with, which means you've got to do something else to clean your copper very well before you solder to it. And that ultimately means you've got to clean it within an hour of soldering to it. Okay, we'll get into that. Why is that? Why is the military so stringent? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, someone's life depends on it if that circuit doesn't work at the right time. And let's face it, that circuit is probably going to sit around for six months or a year or two years before anyone uses it <laughs> in a lot of cases. Okay? So, uh, and you have the same problem in, in batteries and flashlights. If you don't use the, the, the thing uh, and you start seeing this thing will start corroding and you know, throwing off uh, a white powder deposit. I mean, we, the lights went out a couple of weeks ago at home and so I got down this little battery lantern. Sure enough, it didn't work because the batteries had been in there for probably two years since I put them in and it was corroded. So I had to go upstairs, get some new batteries and clean off the contacts and yeah, I got it working again. Okay. Um, anyway, so things that are easily soldered, soldered to, you may use uh, um, non-activated or activated fluxes. Things like lead or nickel or brass, um, you can't use a non-activated flux. You've got it, or actually, you have to use a strongly activated flux. When you get to things that are more difficult to solder, solder like galvanized steel, which is zinc chloride, or zinc, a zinc surface, zinc oxide, tin, nickel, nickel iron, mild steel, you can't just use rosin, rosin solders. You gotta use the zinc chloride, ammonium chloride type of fluxes, which are much more aggressive. Full of chlorides, very corrosive. So, um, how do we know how long you got to wait? on copper, because we're usually soldering to copper, which is part of some print circuit board or whatever. This comes out of things, uh, okay, yeah, this is. Dissolution rates at various temperatures for a number of metals in 60, and in lead tin solder, okay? So at different temperatures, actually one of the things that Manco has as a fifth thing is he has, says there is some activation temperature for the solder or for the flux. Well, there's not really an activation temperature, but it turns out chemical reactions follow it, an Arrhenius exponential growth with temperature, okay? The, the reaction rate goes exponentially with temperature, goes up exponentially with temperature. So it turns out there's not a unique temperature. This one is probably, or this curve uh, down here goes all the way down and shows there's not a unique temperature the way Manko talked it about it. Bang, there's some magic temperature thing goes from zero to, to 100 miles an hour, okay? Well, in fact, there is a curve and uh, there is a, a particular temperature at which all of a sudden you'll get uh, good chemical reaction. Now, this is the one, oh, this, this is the one I prefer to use. Um, go back to that in a second. Um, here is a plot of the time to get wetting versus the amount of chlorine in your rosin, okay, on copper. If you have freshly clean copper, the wetting time is half a second to wet that copper. And I'll talk a little bit about what, how we get something like that. But as soon as the thing gets hot, basically the half a second is basically to get enough heat into the copper. You just take the copper wire and drop it into a solder bath. It takes a half a second for the copper to heat up from the the lead to the bath because the copper is cold. If you had started with fresh copper, I mean hot copper, and you contacted the two, it would, it would uh, 
clean surface would would, uh, uh, would work immediately. However, if I let it sit in just normal air for one hour at 100 degrees C, it turns out the wetting time goes to like more than 10 seconds. Basically, it doesn't wet in a reasonable soldering time. Two hours, it goes up some more. It doesn't take very long to oxidize that copper surface. And so in general, if you're going to use non-activated fluxes to get rid of this number four problem of being corrosive in service, you've got to clean your parts and solder them immediately afterwards, within minutes. Okay? You can't let them sit around for a couple of days. Okay? And I go into I used to go into plants all the time when I was working in that kind of industry. And they said, oh, we're having soldering problems. And I, one of the first questions is, well, I, I basically go through and, and ask, well, how are you cleaning them? When did you clean them? How long are they sitting around? And almost invariably, it's because, oh, yeah, we clean them on Friday and we're soldering with them on Monday. Well, they're no longer clean. Okay? It takes very little time okay, to contaminate that surface. So um, really good electronic uh, you know, print circuit board shops essentially have the cleaning process and it goes dr dramatic uh, immediately with no buffer inventory in between. It goes into the soldering operation. Okay? You don't wait. Okay? Uh, but most shops have sort of learned that the hard way. Um, abetic acid, just to let you know, there's abetic acid. So I don't even try to write down the formula. Oop, that's, uh, that's, that's not a beating. That's, that's a different acid. Here's a beating. Okay, it's simpler. Okay, it's just a complex organic uh, molecule. And it's not a particularly strong a acid. Okay. Um, but uh, it will clean a little bit of copper tarnish. It has great spreading activity and thermal stability. Now, uh, any questions? That. So let's talk about how do you solder to aluminum. It, it can be done, okay? Well, actually, this is uh, another way to look at it. To remove the oxides, you can chemically dissolve it. That's abetic acid. It turns out abetic acid dissolves copper oxide. It actually doesn't. Well, I've seen some things that claim that you form a copper, copper abiet, okay, which means you've got uh, an ion of the of the abetic acid organic molecule, but some things argue that all you're doing is, it turns out abetic acid will dissolve copper oxide. Copper oxide as the molecule will dissolve the abetic acid. It doesn't really matter. You can have, you can have fluxes that just dissolve the surface contamination of the oxide, or you can have reduction. Chlorides will change the oxide to a chloride. It exchanges the oxygen and the copper, it forms copper chloride and the copper chloride uh, and will float away in, in, the, in the flux. Or you can use hydrogen. I said you can sometimes flux with gases. And hydrogen is a very reductive gas. In many cases, you can use, some cases, I better not say many cases, but sometimes people use um, a reactive gas to remove the surface oxide. Not as much in soldering, but in brazing, that's what you often do. You often will have a hydrogen atmosphere through your cleaning. Or you can use a reaction flux, and there are several reaction fluxes, but the only one I'm really familiar with is the one for aluminum. Um, and essentially a reaction flux is a flux that forms tin chloride and zinc chloride. So it's basically a specially for formulated, mostly fluoride flux, but it contains some tin and some zinc salts. And it doesn't really dissolve the aluminum oxide, it floats it off. The reaction flux, I think I've had it in, in uh, uh, print and uh, quotation marks, because this actually is not a chemical reaction. What happens is, as you heat things up, the aluminum oxide on the surface of the aluminum will actually form little cracks in this somewhat corrosive material. And then it turns out the aluminum will react with the tin chloride to form aluminum chloride plus tin. And the tin, or the zinc, will go through the cracks and float away the aluminum oxide. You don't reduce the aluminum oxide. You don't chemically destroy it. 
you basically crack it up. It's like it's like an icebreaker going through the, the pack ice, cracking it up and pushing it aside. Okay? You're not getting rid of the ice, you're not melting it, you're not dissolving the, the aluminum oxide, you're just breaking it up and pushing it aside, and you have a high energy metal that comes in and undermines it and lifts it up, and you end up with a solderable surface. Now the problem with the reaction flux is they're very hydroscopic. A lot of these salts, the zinc chloride and, and stuff, but even more importantly, these zinc and tin chlorides are often in a, in a flux that is something like um, uh, sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride is a good rat poison, okay? It's not good to lay around in case kids eat it, but most kids are too salty. Anyway, uh, sodium fluoride is actually given therapeutically if you need more, I mean, some of the, uh, when you get fluoride for your teeth, sometimes they use sodium fluoride. A lot of times they use stannous fluoride, tin fluoride. But sometimes you use sodium fluoride because it's cheaper. So in low doses, it's good for your teeth. In bad doses, in higher doses, it kills rats. Um, but anyway, uh, all right. Uh, hmm? Good for kids now. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, actually, if you look at some of the toothpaste, they'll, they will say they use sodium fluoride. Because it's cheaper than standard fluoride, it's very expensive. Tin is, is an expensive metal. Um, but anyway. Um, so they have things like sodium fluoride or strontium fluoride, or, but some of these fluorides are not just hydroscopic, meaning they, they pick up moisture, they're deliquescent. And deliquescent means it's not just hydroscopic, it's super hydroscopic. You put a, a grain of one of these salts, if you sprinkle the little salt of some of these fluorides on the table, and you come back an hour later in this room, you'll see big drops of water where every grain of salt was. I mean, it'll, take, it'll soak up water to a hundred or hundreds of times its original weight, okay? Um, that's what a deliquescent salt is. Well, the problem is with the reaction flux, if it gets a lot of moisture in it, it quits working because what happens is you end up oxidizing the aluminum chloride and things like that. You just reform the, the the free aluminum here that you wanted to get in contact with tin to change the surface from an aluminum surface into a tin surface that really is what you're soldering to, essentially becomes just another aluminum oxide. The aluminum is more reactive and it'll break down the water. Aluminum plus H2O, remember what uh, Carol Sanders learned, he could shoot bullets into that aluminum and he could get it to react with beef liver, right? It'll react with almost anything. Um, so moisture kills these things, and I can remember one time I got a call from some people in Florida, and they were they were doing aluminum soldering. And very few people do aluminum soldering, and uh, and I said, "Oh, you are." I mean, it's kind of I've only run into two or three people in my life who ever did aluminum soldering. I did some aluminum soldering once, and sure enough, I didn't clean the flux off very well. I came back a year later, and the whole thing fell apart because it corroded. Okay because I didn't clean all the stuff off. And it's deliquescent and everything else, just soaks up the water and corrodes. Well, they were in Florida. Well, that's the last place I want to be using an aluminum flux. It's sort of humid in Florida. I mean, if I'm gonna do aluminum soldering, I'd rather be in Arizona, okay, with low humidity. Um, and I tried to talk them through it, and they didn't seem to understand that they had to keep the water out, okay? But literally, you, you take the jar off the uh, some aluminum, uh, aluminum soldering flux, and you leave that jar open in a room in Cambridge for more than about three or four hours, you might as well throw the whole jar away, okay? You will have contaminated it with enough humidity from the air that it's just not gonna work. So you really have to be careful, but it can be done, and then you have to re be re really scrupulous about cleaning it off. Now, one of the things, We've talked about the reliability, and I talked about the circuit boards and stuff, and what a complex composite this is, and how you have to have 100% reliability. Um, well, it turns out on something like this, where you're laminating it, you can't fix things on the inside afterwards. It's not repairable, okay? And so you gotta, gotta make sure that everything's right before you start. 
but I came across this the other day, which I've had people talk about it many times. It's the first time I saw someone plot it. But the repair costs on a logarithmic scale, pre-solder visual testing. So they take these big sheets of plastic, and they actually, when they say visual, they actually have a big computer. They have a scanner, and the computer is doing the visual for you nowadays. But it scans this whole thing to make sure you have no shorts or no opens, okay, on your on your plated piece of plastic that you're going to laminate. If you catch it, then you can fix it for less than a dollar. If you, on a circuit board, if you find that you have a problem and you're burning and think the circuit doesn't work or something, it's, you can go in and fix it many times, but it costs you ten bucks to fix it. And I told you the Motorola pager story in Boynton Beach, Florida, where the guy decided they were not going to have a repair station or an air repair area to be able to fix 6% of the product. Well, you know, they basically would, if you think about the 6%, it sort of, sort of makes sense. If the cost goes up by a factor of 16 from, from here to here, well, yeah, you can sort of afford to repair 6%, but you can't afford to repair 12%, okay? But the best thing is to get rid of this completely by doing a proper job over here. But if you go to system testing, once you put that circuit board into, you know, the th level three where you've got, got it on a, uh, a rack or something, and you've got the whole thing inside its, its big package, it typically can cost you 40 or 50 bucks to get in there just because the whole thing is more, more complex. And what do you typically do? You swap out circuit boards, right? You just, if you have a, a replacement board, you just, in fact, if you've ever had to fix a piece of electronics and you call up the, the uh, manufacturer, um, they will sell you a board. And if you swap it out and it fixes it, you have to buy, you know, they actually will sell you the board, you get to pay for it, you pay for it already. And if it doesn't fix it, you can send it back for a credit. And then they'll sell you another board. I got an instrument or a, a wire EDM machine and the circuit boards cost $5,000 a piece. And there's like 10 of them. We were swapping them out one at a time, and it turns out if you have a problem on two boards, you never find the problem <laughs> if you only buy one board at a time, right? So it's okay. But anyway, it took us a year and a half to figure to get that machine up and running again because I just didn't want to spend twenty thousand dollars on boards to find out which ones are really bad. But field repair, you're talking big bucks because now you're paying for the labor for someone to go to the site. You're paying all the travel time. And this is this type of, I found it in a soldering book, but I've heard about this in all kinds of industries. Doesn't matter whether you're making cars, circuit boards, or whatever, your, your repair costs go up exponentially with how far downstream in the manufacturing process. And it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Think about it. On, on ships, right? You find it in the shipyard while you're making it. It's cheap. If you find it when you're outfitting the new ship, it's a little more expensive. You get out there in the real world, and it, I mean, they're flying things in on clear jets around the world to bring you spare parts, right? Okay. Well, not yet, right? Uh, so the prices go astronomical. So it turns out it's cheaper to build it right in the first place, but fortunately for me, most people don't learn that lesson. Okay. Um, because they don't bring me in to fix the things that are going to cost 60 cents to fix. Um, questions? Actually, why don't we take a break? Okay. Uh, the question was asked at the break of how do you apply the flux? We apply the flux in every way you can possibly consider. Okay. Um, sometimes if you go to the hardware store, well, it comes in a little squeeze bottle if it's the zinc chloride flux and it's, you just squirt it on, right? And I've done that times. It's sort of fun sometimes. You heat it up and you apply a little bit of the solder and sometimes I then squirt the, the cold flux on a hot piece of copper pipe and you see all this bubbling and stuff and then you see it spread, okay? So it's balled up and then you can, you know, kind of put it on while it's hot and you see it spreading. I just, that's just kind of me for fun, right? Uh, but that's not the way you usually do it. But sometimes you just squirt it on. Um, other times, um, it comes as a paste 
and uh, it comes a little, a little brush. We call, we call these acid brushes. It's just a little plastic bristle brush with a metal handle usually, or a plastic handle nowadays. And you just paint it on, okay? Now this is if you're talking about soldering of copper pipes like a plumber, okay? Uh, but that's not the best way for a plumber to do it. I'll talk about that in a second. If you're talking about ele electronics, um, if you're doing hand soldering, um, you may um, paint it on, but more commonly, we basically take a piece of lead, in the old days, with lead tin solder, they would extrude the lead tin solder with the flux on the inside. So you would have a cord wire, and they, uh, they call it rosin core solder. If you look at the cross section of the wire, it might have six or seven cores of solder, and so they, they extruded the lead tin solder, and you got cores of the rosin solder on the inside. So as you feed the, the wire in to melt it off, you're feeding flux into the joint. Okay. Uh, other times, you you may just paint the flux around it um, with that little brush. Um, in a big printed circuit board thing like this, they do what's called wave soldering. Okay. In wave soldering, um, you basically have a Got lots of printed circuit boards to do. And you basically will have, it'll be something as long as this room or three times as long as this room, depending on how many you have to do, and as wide as the printed circuit boards, or so three, four, five feet wide in some cases for the equipment. But you have, and you, in the bottom, you have a big tank of, of solder. So here's your tank of solder in, in the bottom might be molten, in the old days molten lead tin, nowadays we're getting rid of uh, the lead. And um, show it like this. And the printed circuit boards would come in on a conveyor and typically they might be at some sort of angle. So there's a whole row of these things. And the, uh, the solder will be pumped up a weir on this thing and flow over the dam, okay? Flow over the weir. So I just have a, a region of hot molten solder, and the printed circuit board comes in, and as it comes past this thing, it just gets coated with solder. And the flux is a foam. Everything kind of rides into this foam of flux. Okay, you use a foam flux, it's cleaning it off, and then it rides, this thing rides into this over this little dam of molten solder flowing over it. And you you uh, make the solder joints that way. Um, so anyway, there's lots of different ways of applying the flux. Virtually anything you can think of, someone's figured out some geometry, some form of very low viscosity liquid, uh, high viscosity paste, foams, you name it, okay? so. It just depends on the volume, whether it's a manual process or whatever. Now, the best way for a plumber to make a solder joint is a white joint. And I've actually seen union plumbers do this because they're working by the hour, right? Uh, other plumbers don't. But if you if you insert uh, a copper pipe into a into a, a you know, uh, an elbow or a T or whatever. So you slide one in the other. A lot of us will just heat the whole thing up, and you shouldn't heat the solder directly. You should heat the copper to a temperature so that the uh, when you want you touch the wire to the copper, the heat from the copper going into the solder melts it, rather than the heat from the flame of the torch. Okay, you can heat up the solder very quickly with the torch flame. If the copper is not warm, you won't get wetting. And I've seen some major floods in Boston because some, some plumber's putting in a three inch pipe and he doesn't know how to solder properly and he heats the solder and he puts a little fillet around that thing, okay? And you don't get flow between the joint, okay? In fact, in terms of raising, that type of problem is why a lot of people think the thresher went down, 
okay? If you've got a joint like this, you've got your pipe inside your, your, uh, your uh, union or T or, or elbow or whatever, if you, they call it face feeding, if you face feed uh, the wire in here and you put your torch directly on the wire, you can form a nice little fillet, beautiful looking fillet, but you haven't heated up the base material and so you've got no spreading down the joint, right? And like I said, I've come in, someone, some plumber just, well, they had $7 million at the Charles Hotel, you know, major flood up on the roof. They had a, I think it was a four or five inch pipe on the uh, air conditioning water cooling system for the whole building. And this is a, well, a five-star hotel in Cambridge, right outside of Harvard Square. And um, turned it on, and about four or five hours after they finished this joint, the whole thing lets go, and we're all done. You can still see mostly bare copper in here. The solder had never flowed down here, okay, over 60, 70% of the area. Uh, $10 million worth of problems at the Hilton Hotel in uh, Dulles, Virginia, near Dulles Airport, because they bring in a bunch of uh, uh, inexpensive labor, doesn't know how to solder. They make joints that you visually expect it. You see a nice so they see a nice fillet on the outside, but you never heat it up the inside. So you should put your torch heat right in here, and then by conduction, when you put your, your braze or your solder on there, you want the heat from the copper or the steel, depending on what the pipe is, to conduct into the to the filler metal and melt it. And then you know it's going to flow in here. Okay? Now, it turns out what they did for the thresher, after or not thresher, they think it was a poorly done face fed joint because that's how they used to make braze joints. And there was a braze joint apparently on some of the main seawater piping. Uh, there's, there's various theories on the thresher. And, uh, but anyway, one of the things they did afterwards is they changed the joint geometry so that they put if, all right, have you seen this, an electric boat? Someone? No, we have joints like that. Okay. You put the solder in here in a wire or the filler metal. And now you, you flux the thing. You, you paint on the flux or you let liquid flux come in here. And the guy heats up the whole thing. He, he never heats up the solder uh, filler metal or the brace metal. And when it flows out, and you form a, a fillet out here, the visual inspection of the fillet means you know you got a good joint. Okay? It's a good technique. And that was developed for the shipyards after the thresher. This was one part of the substate program, if you've ever heard of that. Okay? So that's, uh, if you go through a shipyard now and they're brazing piping, that's how they're doing it. Rather than face feeding, because they think it was a bad, bad face fed joint. And I've got, I've got multi-million dollar plumbing failures in Boston, just in Boston, okay? Also in, I guess, Washington, D.C., that I've worked on where people just do a lousy job of soldering. Um, by doing face feeding and not heating up the whole thing. Somewhere in here, which brings up sort of another, another question. Show you this page from something else the other day, uh, but I didn't show you this this graph. This is a graph that shows you the joint width in millimeters on log scale versus the fill ratio. 100% fill means I have no voids on the, the the joint, and what what the width joint width means is what's the overlap here? Okay. If it's only two millimeters, let's say I'm putting just some sheet metal together rather than a pipe, and I've only got two millimeters as a width, the solder will flow in and it will sweep any porosity out the other side, right? And the reason I say two millimeters, there's two millimeters right there. I come up, I can get 100% joint with no voids. If I have a wider joint, if I have a centimeter joint, which if you go look at your plumbing in your house, 
you know, the overlap when you put the copper pipe into the elbow or whatever. It's a it's three eighths of an inch, if not a half an inch. So we're over here. The fill ratio is 60 percent. What happens is as the liquid is flowing in to this joint, you'll get the the, the front will progress up faster this way than that way, and you'll have things come around and trap voids in the middle. And there's no way, there's no exit for that surface tension to, to push the bubble out if it's very wide joint. So part of this pressure establishing some saving in a QA department essentially for the, for the Navy, but what, what's the sort of ceiling equivalent? Do they have, I mean, I know there's not a, um, like the, ABT, but. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, for plumbers, there never was a standard until the late 90s, the Copper Development Association, because sometimes you would have failures, came up with a standard. Now it's an ASTM standard, has picked up with the Copper Development Association. And they basically say you should have a 70% joint. Okay? Um, and a 70% joint, look at this, the fill ratio, it turns out for lead tin solders, you usually can get only 30% void. But if you look at it, typically you'll have 30% void on those pipes in your house. And I didn't bring it with me, I guess I could, should have, uh, maybe I'll bring it Monday. You take an x-ray, so you get beautiful x-rays on copper joints with lead tin solder, because the lead in there, you know, is pretty dense, right? And so you see these big, big voids. But usually, you, uh, you can have 30% voids, and you, the joint's plenty strong, because that overlap is huge. Half an inch of overlap, the thickness of the copper is less than a millimeter. Right? So you got plenty of area. The Copper Development Association, now the ASTM standard, which was sort of adopted 2004 type of time frame, as I remember, basically says 30% voids are acceptable. And that's what this data says. Okay? It's probably what you're going to get. But you, can, you, you have to do it when you inspect it. You can do it ultrasonically, or you can do it by x-ray. Well, who's going to x-ray a joint in your house plumbing? Okay? You're going to spend 100 bucks to x-ray a joint? Okay? But if you, you know, let me tell you that Hilton Hotel and Dulles Airport, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars x-raying joints because it was millions of dollars of, of, you know, sprinkler systems. They were not intended to be sprinkler systems in the building. They were actually supposed to be the water <laughs> delivery system. But they did have a sprinkler system, too. But the, or actually they had a sprinkler system that was self-activating all the time, <laughs> okay? Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, you get mold both in the walls and all the, you know, the problems are going to be a real mess. Anyway, the spec actually says if you measure it by an x-ray, it has to be 30% by area, but any given line has to have, if you draw a line around the, the circumference of the pipe, any line has to have 70% solder. So you, it's not just 30% by area, it's 70% on any line that you traverse. So the spec actually is a fairly tight spec. Um, probably 50% of the joints out there would fail the spec. Okay, but who's going to inspect them? <laughs> okay, until after the thing fails, and then they're going to say, oh, it's a bad solder joint. And I've been running into that. In the last five years, I've run into five or six times. Some guys say, oh. I found a void in the solder joint. Yeah, okay. I mean, if it's a, you know, an overlap joint in a pipe, what do you expect? That's, na that's nature, okay? That's the way the solder flows in there. Even on a joint like this, you may only have 10 or 20 percent when it flows out, okay? But you're still going to have some, okay? It's, it's still there. Um, so it's not just face feeding. Uh, did that answer your question? I don't know if it did or not. I didn't, I didn't even let you finish answering. What was your question? Well, I guess, is, is there some kind of equivalent of a QA in the civilian world? Like, what do they have to prove to the customer? Um, I mean, if the customer is ignorant about the subject, then how can they really prove it? Or well, in fact, what they've been doing for years is the plumber solders it up, then does a test to see how many leaks he has. Okay? And if you actually talk to the plumbers, when they were using, when they were able to use lead tin up until 1978 in Massachusetts, they'd be able to solder those things up, put a 200 joints in the in the boiler system for you know for your uh, home heating system, and they'd pressurize it and have zero leaks. 90% of the times, 
they get 100% joints with lead tin. Then in 1978, lead was outlawed because of lead. Our children are stupid because they've been drinking the water. <laughs> no, no, it's genetic, folks. It's genetic. <laughs> children are stupid because you're the parent. <laughs> uh, but they don't like to hear that. So nonetheless, um, they, the, if you talk to the plumbers, and I have talked to the plumbers, and they say now they have to use like 95, uh, 10, 2% antimony, 3% silver. That's basically what's approved for plumbing, you know, potable water plumbing in, in houses in Massachusetts. And now they'll make 200 joints and they'll leak check them and they'll have five or 10 of them fail. But they always have to go back after they leak check. So, but that's still the standard. And usually, if you've done it properly, if you use the proper technique and you're not running into face feeding and heating up the wire, okay, you don't have to do this, okay? That's a good technique, but you don't have to do that, okay? Um, the, uh, if you've done a, a good solder joint, you know the technique of heating the copper to make the metal flow, don't heat the filler metal, but heat the, heat the base metal, it will be hot, and if the flux is working, you'll get a good joint. And there's so much, a, a full joint here probably has a factor of 50 structural safety. So if you lose a factor of 20, you still got a factor of 30. Right? Or even if you lost a multiple of 20, you still got a factor of two and a half. Okay? So in general, they don't fail unless the technique, you know, the procedure that the person used was really, really bad. Okay? You go down to the Plumber and Gas Fitters Union Hall down here on Mass Ave in Dorchester, and you go in there and they have this beautiful laboratory to qualify people who are going to do the plumbing for the hospitals. These are union shops, and these guys have to come in on Saturday, and in order to get the job to do the work in the hospital for the medical gases and stuff, they're gonna be brazing or soldering all these pipes, they have to go through two or three days worth of training on how to make the joints. In this case, the, quali the QA for pipe brazing and soldering is in the technique. You've got a joint that has got a huge factor of safety, and even though you're going to lose, you know, 30% of your joint in terms of voids, it's still plenty strong. Okay, um, and that's basically why things work. But if the guy's got the wrong te technique, they can turn out bad joints like that. You know, I mean, just every one of them, or every fourth one, or something, is going to be a piece of, piece of junk. Uh, so it really is. In that case, doing the right procedure. So that's how it works. And it's only in the last 10 years that we've really got standards that need to be called out. They're not required yet by law, but they will be written in to contracts over the next 10 years because now there's an ASTM spec that the contractor, some engineer's going to say, you've got to meet this quality. But the thing is, no one's going to check until they have a leak. Okay? But then when they have a leak, they're going to hang you with it, right? With the spec. So anyway, um, but it's a problem because it's not necessarily uh, inspectable. I'll give you another example. You know the <coughs> propane gas tanks that you use for plumber's torches? I actually have a cross section of one. But the, to make the braze joint for the valve, the, you've got, well, the tank looks like this, right? And it's got the little threaded valve up here. To make that joint, well, first of all, the joint is actually formed like that and the, and the valve comes in like this. And so you're, actually the valve, I didn't do it quite right. The valve with the thread comes in like this. And the tank itself comes in like this. So your bonded area, I don't have colored chalk, I have filler chalk over here. But your bonded area is this. So you, you go around that whole corner, okay? Now, the, the Department of Transportation regulates these because it's a fuel gas cylinder, and they, they it's not the boiler and pressure vessel code or, or anybody else. 
you have to carry these on the highway in theory. Certainly a pro big propane tank you carry them on, a, on the highway. And so the DOT regulates these on the self Department of Transportation. They say that this joint, but even though the thickness here, the wall thickness is 0.75 millimeters, okay, the joint must have a length of four millimeters. That's written in the Code of Federal Regulations. That's written in the law by Congress. The actual joint there is about 10 to 12 millimeters. So you can have 50% void, and you still got more than four millimeters. And you actually have it on two surfaces. This surface is a very thin joint, which means the capillary attraction is huge. This joint is not always thin. In fact, sometimes you'll see a crack in here. Sometimes you may have um, a void because the thing didn't get pressed down far enough and the gap is too large. But what do they do to place it? Looking down on the top, they put four dots of brazing paste right around there, right around the, the fillet here. Okay? And how do they inspect it? They have someone look at it, everyone that comes out of the furnace, if they've got a nice fillet that goes 360 degrees around, it's a good good tank. It's furnace spray, so everything gets up to temperature. You don't have a problem like you have here with a, a torch and you're not heating up the whole thing. Everything gets to the uniform temperature. You've got a flux. If the flux is working, you get a good solder fillet 360 degrees around. If you've got a good solder fillet, you also have a thinner joint here, which attracts it down here even more strongly than it will up here. So um, very high, very high reliability. In terms of the joint design and how you solder, place the solder and the flux. Okay? So you really develop a procedure that is robust. Okay? You're still gonna have flaws. You know, I've got I got clowns all over the country who say, Oh, I found a void in your solder joint or your brace joint. Yeah, well, but it didn't fail there. <laughs> okay? And it's also got, you know, two and a half times the DOT bonded area. So, oh, but I found a, found a void. It must have caused the defect or the failure. No, it caused the failure because, did I tell you the story about the plumber in California? Okay, so he's, he's soldering this, this woman's pipe out of the street with powerful water coming in. It's a solder pipe. He's got a 45 degree elbow and uh, there's a little hole that he had to dig to get to, the, get to the pipe. He's lying on his stomach on the grass between the sidewalk and the driveway and the, uh, and the street. He's lying on the sidewalk. He's got a cell phone in one hand. He's got a cigar in his mouth. And he's got the torch in the other hand trying to solder while he's talking on the cell phone. And the little 45 degree elbow slips off. So he starts using the, the torch, the lit torch, as a hammer, okay, to pound the, the thing back on because he's busy with the cell phone con conversation. And the, the grandmother walking her grandchild down the street and the woman in the house, the house is being repaired, she just happens to look out the window and they see this eight foot flame, <laughs> okay? Because he broke the neck of the cylinder. I mean, it's bent 20 degrees, right? You don't use torches as hammers, okay? But the more common thing, <laughs> well, you do if you're talking on the cell phone, you got a little cigar in your mouth. <laughs> but you don't have to, we didn't have to have a lit cigar because I got a lit torch. Okay? I mean, we don't have to worry about which the ignition source was, right? We got a got source of ignition, whether you had the cigar in his mouth or not. But, but I mean, it, kind of, it kind of goes to the safety of the Gucci was worrying about, you know, you know using, uh, this is actually mat gas, which is, uh, uh, burns hotter than propane. Anyway, more like acetylene. That's another part of the lecture. Actually, that would be the lecture, if we kept on going, it would be about two, hour, two hours ahead in the uh, lecture here. It comes in flames just afterwards. Anyway, so, um, the problem is you can get very burned very badly in these fireballs, okay? People have horrible burns. But anyway, what happened to them? Yeah. Uh, it hit them, they settled with them. I don't know, if, I mean, they never tell you how much. But what happened to him? Well, fortunately, he was on his stomach, so he only kind of got in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
different, uh, uh, I mean, current one, we have a guy who was probably smoking methamphetamines. He was using the torch to vaporize the crystal meth. And uh, uh, he had very, very severely burned lips. Um, and we don't really think he was using the torch to light his lips. Okay. Although there was a guy, and one I wasn't involved in, where a guy was using one of these smack gas torches to light a cigarette. Okay. <laughs> Works. I bet you. I bet you it burns that cigarette, lights it real quick. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, but anyway, these things are, these these cases are sort of incredible. What people do to things. I mean, one guy was trying to light uh, his campfire stove. He had his wife and kids there in a campground around the Bay in California, right next to the ocean. Um, and uh, the wood was wet, and so he started cursing and getting upset with the wood. And there's there's a dispute between the people at the other campsites and, and stuff of whether he claims he, he claims he was just holding onto the torch and just spontaneously broke. I mean, the metal just spontaneously disintegrated, right? Uh, other people say they saw him throw it into the fire because he got frustrated that his backcast torch wasn't working so he threw it into the fire. Not a good idea to throw it. Okay. Other people claim that he was banging it on the concrete fire ring in this campsite. Uh, you know. Anyway, at the end, the whole thing was thrown into the ocean so no one ever found the cylinder. I mean, it's just whatever. I don't remember all the details. Um, it's amazing what people will do with these tools. And in fact, one of the one of the things I've had a number of these. Um, uh, a guy will typically I've had one where we think the guy he was soldering in the basement and he had it up on the the windowsill of the basement window was a little higher, and he claims it just fell five feet to the ground and just broke and that's what caused it to release all its gas. I think it's a propane cylinder, and uh, you I think the DOT regs require that you do like a 15 foot drop test thing not you know you can it can bend but it's not supposed to release gas and he claimed he only dropped it for five feet but um, I looked at the dent metal and um, I calculated by equivalent energy and you know, the energy that it took for me to reproduce a, sing, a similar bend uh, I calculated that it had to either drop from 20 feet which was unlikely in the basement okay that it dropped from 20 feet or that it was thrown to the ground at a speed of about 40 miles an hour, okay? So if you think about it, if you're doing something else, not paying too much attention, and you reach for the torch, and you actually, the torch is lit up there, and you actually grab the flame, then sometimes people actually will throw it to get rid of it. And sometimes when that hits something like concrete, and this has been two or three cases, uh, you know, if you're throwing something to get rid of it, you may not be Roger Clemens throwing a 100 mile an hour fastball, but you can probably get 45 miles an hour. And 45 miles an hour is equivalent to about a 30 foot drop. So it's likely that if you throw a lit fuel gas tank to the floor, you know, to get rid of it as quick as you can, it's likely that it will end up in a fireball and you'll be caught in it. Okay? And that happens. I mean, it doesn't happen every day. They make, they make tens of millions of these things. And there's only one or two people out there a year who, you know, go burning themselves up. But their burns are very bad. But anyway, uh, but it's not because of bad brace joints, okay? Particularly, you know, the British did a study because they were going to import these. Uh, they were, we we're going to export these. Or most of these cylinders, even around the world, are made in the United States, though. And uh, the British were going to import them, so. One British agency did a test to see if these things were going to be safe in transit. They were really worried about someone drops the container ship, you know, or you're going to have, you know, a whole a whole bunch of these things go boom on the dock or something, right? Uh, or they, they were so they went and they they would throw these things into fires. I mean, this is a laboratory, no, an outdoor laboratory test. <coughs> they would actually throw them into fires until they would just burst from the, the pressure and stuff. They actually have a pressure relief valve, so they should turn into a flamethrower. The pressure relief valve should go, and then all the gas can you know, shoot, come shooting out in one direction as a flamethrower, but they even defeated that in some cases, so they would burst. But they never had a failure at the brace joint, because the brace joints have this big overlap, 
they got a factor. I think I calculated a factor of 40 safety in terms of strength for that brace joint compared to the steel. Okay? They test two of these to failure every day, or every thousand or something, they have to take one and just, and just uh, you know, fill it with water and pressure test it. Always fails in the steel. They've never had a failure in a brace joint. You just design them with huge safety factors in the joints. Huh? Pardon me? Pretty good. Well, I mean, that's thousands of, tens of thousands of tests, and they've never had a failure in the brace joint. But you did have someone do a visual inspection to make sure you didn't, you didn't send to test the ones that had incomplete fillets, right? So the, whether you're soldering copper pipes in the basement or whether you're so, soldering fuel gas cylinders or brazing fuel gas cylinders, <coughs> if your procedure is correct, you probably do okay. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if you're using the torch as a hammer, that's an incorrect procedure. Okay, and you're probably not going to do okay. Or if you're smoking crystal meth, okay. Anyway, to, to get a uh, uh, something that, that that's that strong, are they using just a normal uh, lead yep. tin solder? Oh no, this is a brace joint. This is actually a, a copper nickel solder in this case. Um, so far as the copper nickel phosphorus in this case, which we don't want to get into. But it's pretty, pretty, pretty strong. Oh yeah, the, the same thing as you soldered the turbine plates with, stuff, okay? It's similar to what you use in other parts of Jet Engine. I'm going to use these on Monday to give you some examples. But um, typical braze joint have five, ten thousand PSI strength. So hey, you know, if I got an area that's ten times big, bigger than the cross section of the steel. And it's got five or ten thousand psi strength. Who cares if the seal's got fifty thousand psi strength? I've got more than that in the brace joint because of the area difference, right? The force necessary to fail it. Right. And I mean, these people have gone out. And they they take a chain and they pull on it, the neck of the, the torch. They, they they anchor it to the ground out somewhere in the mountains of California, and they 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 pull on it. And sometimes they have a ignition source close, close by, and sometimes they don't. And they keep Pulling and they get they have to get about a 20 degree bend. Now I dropped them on the floor of my office and gotten a five degree bend. Okay, but a five degree bend doesn't release gas. A 20 degree bend, you bend it far enough and it will it will break. But it breaks in the steel, not in the brace joint. The only one I ever saw fail in a brace joint was one on the, one of these tests in California. They pulled it and they actually broke in the steel. And they had a huge fireball, and then about which is burning for 10 or 20 seconds, and then they pulled it some more. Well, at that point, they had melted the braze joint. Okay, so when they pulled it again, they had un unbrazed it, right? So what they failed was a hot joint. Okay, that's the only joint I've ever seen fail at the joint, but it was because it had been heated up to melting temperature the braze, and that's not too surprising that you can unbraze the braze joint, right? Right. So anyway, so you know. To make a manufactured product, it involves design, materials, and assembly, and everything else. And then the other thing, in fact, that's, that's what they think about. When you're doing failure analysis, I always like to say you can have a defect in design, you can have a defect <coughs> in material. The material can be defective, have voids or something. You can have a defect in assembly or manufacture. They didn't put together properly. <laughs> or you can have a use of service, or a combination of these. But usually, if you're trying to figure out what's going on, okay, a lot of times you just you don't have a lot of facts. And so a lot of times I'll go back here and say, well, is there a defect in design? And sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. But sometimes you say, no, they've been doing this for a hundred years, <laughs> okay? Or they, you know, is the brace joint defective? They make 25 million of these things, and they've never had a failure of the brace joint in all the tests they've ever done, which is tens of thousands of tests. So is that a defective design in the brace joint? I don't think so. Okay, the defect in the material, you gotta look at the actual component. Uh, when they throw the part away, it's harder to look at the actual component. Uh, assembly, yeah, if you don't put it together properly, or abuse of service. So assembly would be the thresher problem. Okay, you, get, you didn't heat it properly. It's not a defect in the design, 
you could say it's a defect in the design of the procedure, but that's really the design of how you assemble it, right? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of ways to do quality control. Uh, I think I got a couple of minutes that I can, not this is all that important, but a lot of times people figure, oh, well, I can just reuse my lead tin solder. Uh, it turns out it's not so simple. It turns out solder chemistry has to be fairly precise. Um, and so a lot of times people will reuse the solder. They put, go through a printed circuit board, and it's got all kinds of materials on it. And the solder bath gets contaminated with other metals, dipping wave soldering operations and things. So you have to be careful and watch the chemistry of your bath. Aluminum, zinc, and magnesium at 50 parts per million are not soluble, well, in lead or tin, and you'll form intermetallics. So your solder bath actually gets these gritty, solid sand particles in them, okay, of tin, aluminum, intermetallics, or whatever. So you have to keep those metals out or keep them down to a very low level. So if you're doing wave soldering and stuff, some companies are just, every week, they just change the whole, you know, five-ton bath of lead tin solder and send it off to the uh, to the refinery for uh, reprocessing to get the chemistry back. Other people, uh, not necessarily in soldering for electronics, but I know some people that did hot dip tinning, so they take copper um, uh, and just take copper sheet or brass sheet and run it through a molten tin bath uh, and they just stuff a day and every night they would basically go back to this big vat of tin and they would go in there with these metal hooks and they'd bring up uh, copper tin intermetallics that had solidified in the bottom of the tank, okay? And they, that's how they extract the copper from the tank that got dissolved into the tin. Uh, okay, anemone is often added, 0.3%. It will improve wetting. Anemone has a higher affinity for oxides than copper does and so actually it's sort of a self-fluxing agent. You got a metal in your solder that wants to suck up the oxygen. Okay. People also report that if they put it in there in a lot of older specifications because it said it'll prevent tin pest. Well, tin pest is the problem that tin will transform from one crystal structure to another at about minus 18 degrees centigrade. And the example I know of that is during World War II in like the winter of 44 or whatever in, in this in Russia, or Soviet Union, I guess it still was there. Um, uh, they had a bunch of tin just stockpiled in a yard, and it got this cold Russian winter that year. And um, when they came back in the spring and the snow had melted, they just had a pile of powder tin, okay, and tin oxide. Because the tin had transformed in the crystal structure. People have often been worried when you, and it, minus 18C is not that cold. Okay, um, it's like you know minus 10F or something like that. Um, and so a lot of people said, oh, well, if you put antimony, a few, few tenths of a percent antimony, you'll prevent the transformation. Turns out lead also does it, and since most of your solder is lead tin, you got 37% lead, then you don't usually have to worry about tin tests. But a lot of specs actually will actually tell you they're putting it in there to prevent it. Arsenic and iron, not 50 parts per million, but 500 parts per million or 200 parts per million for the same reason that this is an aluminum zinc magnesium. Bismuth is someone sometimes put in like anemone because it has a high affinity for oxygen and promote wetting. The problem with bismuth is you better keep it out of steel. So if you're going to recycle circuit boards or something, like in an automobile or, or something, and it's gonna, you're going to recycle the whole car to make the steel, a few parts per million of, of bismuth in steel will completely embrittle the steel and it'll never be usable and you can't refine the steel. You've just made, you know, fill, landfill material, okay? So one of the problems I mentioned, people are looking at bismuth solders and I've been trying to explain <coughs> at conferences and other things, people are spending millions of dollars to get rid of lead in solders and they're looking at a lot of bismuth alloys. I've tried to say, you're just gonna destroy the steel industry, okay? They won't be able to recycle the 500 million tons of steel a year if you contaminate it with automobiles that have got bismuth in it, okay? There is no way to refine bismuth out of, out of iron, okay? Chemically, we can't do it. 
So you really should be keeping the bismuth out. So uh, millions of dollars of research were done on bismuth solders in the 90s. It's all like wasted. Cadmium, which you often get on parts that have been cadmium plated and stuff and you're soldering, it actually, 10 parts per million is harmful um, and promotes dross or oxides on the surface. Gold and copper, you actually can tolerate a fair amount. If you start getting up to 0.08% gold and you just soon send it to the refinery and get your money back, okay? Okay. Um, just as a rule of thumb, silver is 100 times the price of copper and gold is 100 times the price of silver. So gold is 10,000 times as valuable as copper. So you get a very, very much gold. And you get gold on your printed circuit boards. Um, if you get very much gold in there, send it back to the refinery. Nickel, rarely found, but not any serious de detrimental effects at the levels we usually get. Silver is sometimes used, um, uh, but uh, if you put too much in, like over 2%, you get into metallics. A lot of the solders, I mentioned the plumbing solders, have got 2% silver in. 3% antimony, 2% silver, whatever. Sulfur, seven parts per million will destroy the surface of the silver in terms of soldering. Copper sulfides are much more stable than copper oxides, and therefore, a lot of your fluxes are just not going to work. And it doesn't take very much sulfur. Sulfur is a surface active element. It just screws up everything. Okay.